Hey everyone, it's Josh Daniel. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I know circumstances of late in the UK have been quite tough. Um, the pandemic sort of taken its toll on everybody. Um, but now that we're starting to come out the other side of it, I hope that everyone is doing really, really well and feeling better for it. I just wanted to jump on um, and do a bit of a Q and A really. I put out on my Instagram the other day and also on my Facebook um, that I was asking for you guys to submit questions of things that you want to know about me, things that you wanted me to answer in this video um, because I haven't done a Q&A for a long time um, and a lot has changed since the last Q&A. The thing that prompted me to do this first of all actually, um, I did receive this in the post recently um, which is my 100,000 subscriber plaque from YouTube so thank you so much YouTube for sending this out um, and I just also want to say a big thanks to everyone who subscribed to the channel. Um, I know I'm not the most active on this channel, I rarely upload content on here um, and the fact that there's still um, people subscribing to the channel and wanting to see more content um, is is really heartwarming. So thank you so much to everybody who subscribed. So if you like this video, um, then please feel free to hit that like button below um, and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, and thanks again to everyone who subscribed so far. So let's get into the video. What is your biggest childhood fear and are you still afraid of it? Okay, this is an interesting one. My biggest childhood fear, I would probably say, dark water which is a weird one if i'm on holiday and the water is like really blue and like really light then i can swim in it no problem but if the water is dark and i can't see what's underneath then i am absolutely petrified of dark water and i'm still to this day petrified of dark water so i would definitely say that what is your biggest achievement in the last five years I will say that the YouTube plaque was up there um, because I didn't ever think that that was a milestone I would hit. So that's definitely one of them. I'm in a very fortunate position to have a lot of big achievements over the last five years and a lot of things that I'm very proud of. Um, but I would probably say the biggest one would be um, receiving a billion views on YouTube for my audition tape. I remember getting a text from my manager on the day that I found out and he said, We've got some news, you've actually surpassed 1 billion views um, on your audition tape. He said in the message, think of it this way, if there's 7 billion people on the planet, that means one in every seven people that you see in the street, statistically speaking, has seen your audition tape and has seen Tommy's story and has seen um, everything that was captured in that clip. Um, and I think when I read it from that perspective, that really, really hit home um, and that has sat with me for such a long time. Um, so I think I would probably say the, the viewership on that clip, um, I would say is probably my biggest achievement. Do you ever watch your audition tape back? The answer to that one is no. And an interesting fact, which some of you probably won't know, I have never watched my audition tape back since it aired on TV. Um, so since it went out in 2015, I have never watched that clip back. Um, I've only seen it the once. And the reason for that is I often cringe watching myself on camera. Um, and so it's half the fact that I cringe watching myself back and hearing my voice and I just have to, yeah, if anyone ever plays it on YouTube or anything when I'm around, I have to take myself out of the situation straight away because it just makes my skin crawl. Um, so I've never been able to watch it back, partly for that reason. And second of all, because it's actually really, it's a really, really tough clip to watch. Um, I know that it's affected a lot of people and believe me, it affected me a lot. Um, obviously what happened, but also speaking about it, being open about it, um, and being open about it to so many people, something that was so private and dear to me, um, and something that affected me so badly. Um, it was hard for me to open up about it. And so watching that clip back and reliving that moment is, almost too tough of a thought for me to process. So it's half the fact that I don't ever watch any of my videos back, any of my YouTube cover, covers or anything. I don't watch them once I've released them um, because I don't like watching myself on camera. I don't like listening to myself sing. Um, and the other half is because even if I could get over that, I don't think I would be able to sit and 
I mean, maybe I could, maybe I should try, I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you think that I should watch it back and do a reaction video. Um, I know it would be a little bit unusual because it's the first time I've watched it back in five years, but I kind of feel like I would be up to the challenge if it's something that you want to see. Um, I've avoided it up till now, but let me know in the comments if you think that that's something that I should should do. Your most memorable moment on stage. There's one thing that really sticks with me and it's not, it wasn't technically a stage. It wasn't like a gig or a concert. Um, it was actually at the funeral service for Tommy. Um, and I sang a cover of Fix You by Coldplay with my friend called Alex, um, who was playing guitar for me at the time. Um, emotions were running extremely high that day, as you can imagine. Um, and I think I probably only managed to get a handful of words out through the whole song. Um, but it still sits with me as probably the most memorable performance I've ever done. It was really, really tough, but it definitely, definitely sticks with me. Um, so I would probably, I would probably say that one. The second one I would go for on a lighter note, something that's memorable for a, a happier reason, I guess, um, is playing at the Metro Arena to 20,000 people sold out um, on my Christmas tour. That was absolutely incredible. I did it with my full band. It was a full show, full production. And we rehearsed for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks in the lead up to get that show perfect for everyone. Um, and I remember just before we went on stage, um, we were stood behind a big veil. I'll see if I can put a, a picture up on here. I'm terrible at editing, so I might not be able to get it on, but I'll see if I can put a picture on because I'm sure I took a picture just before the, the curtains opened. Um, but it was like a see-through veil, so the audience couldn't see onto the stage, but we could see out into the audience. And so I had about three minutes to stare into a sea of 20,000 people. Um, where they couldn't see us. Um, and then my intro came on the screen and they announced my name and then the curtains opened like that. Um, and my band started playing and it was just absolutely electrifying. Um, so they're probably my top two most memorable moments on stage. What makes you angry about social media? I feel like there's a lot of these controversial topics that I have an opinion on. Um, so I'm glad that some of these questions popped up, to be honest. Um, the first thing that makes me angry about social media is the anonymity. So the fact that anyone, anywhere can create an account with any name, no pictures, no information, no identity check, and then can proceed to bully or um, intimidate or harass other people online whether it be a celebrity or somebody at school or a colleague or I don't like the idea that somebody can be bullied or abused or made to feel a certain way by someone who can't be held accountable for what they're saying um, so that's one thing that really makes me angry about social media I think there should be something in place where people should have to submit ID checks or be verified with a passport or a driving license so that at least when accounts are created, um, if they're ever reported, then that person and that individual, I guess, can be held accountable rather than, um, yeah, being able to be sort of a faceless troll or a faceless bully. Um, I'm quite fortunate that I've never really had much of an issue with trolls or, or bullies on, on my social media personally. But obviously, I'm very, very aware that it's a huge, huge problem um, in our society and in our generation. So I would definitely say anonymity. Yeah. Do you compose songs or do you just perform? So this is an interesting one. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I do actually compose music. I do play piano, play guitar, and then obviously I also sing as well. So I've been writing music since I was very, very young. I have either written or co-written every single song. Um, so every song that you hear on my Spotify, on my iTunes, that isn't a cover, obviously, um, is a song that I have either written wholly on my own or written between myself and somebody else. Um, I haven't ever recorded a song um, and released a song that I haven't written myself to answer that question. Um, and I also compose music. I very recently composed uh, a piece for a TV show in Korea. Um, so that was a song. It wasn't written from my perspective, but it was written to a brief. So um, if a company come to me and say, look, we're, we've got a TV show, we've got um, an idea for a scene and we really need music to go over the top of it. Um, and they either want me to perform or to write the piece for for that scene or for that show or for a soundtrack, then I can sort of compose um, to a brief um, 
and write something from someone else's perspective, even if it hasn't happened to me personally. Um, so yeah, I do compose music, I do write music, um, and whether that be instrumental or, or lyrics, um, and everything that I've released, I've written myself. This was an interesting question. Do you have a tough time dealing with your current level of fame? Here's the first thing. I don't feel like I am famous. To ask me how I feel about my current level of fame, I don't consider myself to be a famous person. Um, what's strange is that I do feel like the definition of fame and, and someone who's famous has changed from years back because a celebrity or a famous person used to be someone who was an A-list celebrity in movies or um, someone who was a high-end clothing designer. Or um, I think now we're in a very different age where um, celebrities are, I suppose, considered to be anyone who's well known. Um, so the likes of your Love Island contestants, the likes of reality TV contestants, people who've been seen on TV and people who are known um, amongst our generation, I suppose. So it's a strange one because I don't think I'm famous, but I do acknowledge that people still recognise who I am. I've been to multiple places in the world over the last few years and I have still, five years later, not adjusted to the fact that people recognise my face, and I genuinely mean that. Um, to be honest with you, when I first came out of the show, um, I actually had quite bad anxiety dealing with the transition, because um, unless you know me, I'm quite an introverted person. Um, I am quite quiet. So until I get comfortable with people, I really open up, and then I'm quite loud. Um, but to be honest, I did struggle in the beginning. Um, and again, I may do a separate video just solely talking about this because mental health is something that's quite important to me. Um, so if that's something that, again, you guys might want me to discuss or to talk about, then let me know in the comments if that's something that um, would resonate with you and then I can look at doing that in another video. Um, but I did struggle in the beginning um, with anxiety. Paparazzi would follow me around, um, taking pictures of me. Um, I couldn't walk down the street without people looking. And don't get me wrong, it was always flattering. It was lovely that people would stop and take time out of their day to make nice comments. Um, but they got to a point where you st I really started to feel quite paranoid when I would see people looking at me in the street or in places where I would go in public. Um, because I would forget that I'd been on TV and this was the issue. I would forget that my audition had gone out on TV. Um, and so if I had just popped down the road to the shop and people were whispering or pointing and looking at me, for a moment I would forget that they may recognise me and I would get really intimidated and embarrassed that people might be looking or pointing or whispering or talking. Um, and then if they would come over and say, can I have a picture? Are you Josh Daniel? Can I have a picture? Then, then I would, it would all sort of click and I think, oh God, like, I don't know why I was so worried. But to me, it was a very, very tough thing to deal with. I did struggle. Um, I don't struggle so much anymore because as I've gotten a little bit older, um, I was 21 when I went on the show and I was quite young. Um, obviously back then and now I'm 26 and um, so as I've gotten a little bit older and more experienced and been on tour and gotten used to circumstances um, and you know a lot of things have changed since then so I, I, I am more accustomed to the idea now but in the very beginning I went from working a nine-to-five job um, to being launched into this world that I didn't understand how it worked um, and I just only ever wanted to be a singer. I didn't want to be famous. I didn't want everyone to know my face. I just wanted to sing and I had a passion for singing. So the fact that you get all of this other stuff that comes with it, that you, some people might say, well, you should expect it because you're going on to one of the biggest TV shows in the UK, you should expect it. But I still don't think you ever realise truly how impactful that is until you actually go through it. So yeah, I, I did struggle in the beginning um, with, um, the the fame uh, or the, the the recognition that came with it um but not so much anymore when did you last cry and what was the reason i'm quite an emotional person um and so you know crying isn't very alien to me it's 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 quite a natural thing for me if ever i get emotional or if i get overwhelmed i do sometimes get 
um, the feeling of wanting to have a little cry. Um, and I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. I don't think it's anything um, out of the ordinary. Um, obviously not everybody's like that, um, but I I am quite an emotional person. Um, and the last time that I remember crying, um, I was flown out to the Maldives on New Year um, to perform um, at a, a resort there. I'd been through various bits and pieces over, over the years, um, before it, um, ups and downs in life, ups and downs in music. Um, I'd been through quite a lot, um, which I've never really spoken about with anyone, um, but I had been through quite a lot. That moment on New Year's Eve, just before I went onto the stage, um, it was just the most beautiful setting that I'd ever seen. Um, it was just actual paradise. Um, and it was so quiet, so peaceful, so perfect. The sand was white and the, and the ocean was, was light blue. And it was just the most perfect setting you could ever imagine. I went for a walk down the beach and I did just think, do you know what? The fact that I'm here because of music, here because of, I, you know, I have a passion for singing. I have a passion for art um, and I write songs, I release songs and they resonate with people and you know I went through experiences, some of them that weren't very positive and I spoke about them and I opened up about them and people heard it loud and clear and people grew to become a fan of me and all my music through that and the fact that it had got me to that moment was so overwhelming for me. Um, I did get I did get quite emotional and did have a little cry at myself when I was on the beach before I went on stage. Um, and some people might find it weird because you think you're in the Maldives, you're in the most magical place, why would you be crying? Um, but it was just a lot, it was a lot. When it comes to it, I'm a regular guy and like you say, I was 21 years old when I went on that show and I worked a nine to five job as a vehicle technician for a car manufacturer. Um, I had always had a passion for singing, but I, if somebody had said to me, you'll be getting flown all over the world to sing and do what you love, um, even five years after, um, you know, and still be self-employed and doing doing what I love and not have to go back to a normal job, um, I would never have believed it. And I think just in that moment, they had my music playing on the jetties um, where the boats were docking. Um, every this was It took me 30 hours to travel to this place and everybody on the island knew who I was and really made me feel so, so special. Um, and so that was the last time that I think I cried um, because like I just got so overwhelmed. I don't know, it was just a lot. And so I had a little sob um and got a little bit emotional okay guys i think i'm going to end the video there so thank you to everybody who submitted questions over on instagram and facebook and twitter for this um sorry if i couldn't get around to answering them all i will be doing another q a soon um but going forwards i do want to do some different types of content not just recording cover videos um so if there's any other topics that i've touched on in today's video that you do want to hear more about specifically anything to do with mental health or anything to do with my reality TV experience or a reaction video to watching my audition back for the first time in five years, then um, let me know in the comments any other ideas or things that you want to see, then feel free to let me know. I am completely open to suggestions. Feel free to subscribe if you haven't already. And those of you who have, thank you so much um, for getting me to over 100,000 subscribers. I will see you on the next one.